Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today we're going to 1969 for a lecture Neville Goddard delivered on May 19th. We haven't really explored a lot of the 1969 lectures, but there are many amazing ones. And this is fantastic, called The Artist is God. Many times we've talked about the concept of God as the artist or the creator and what it means, and here we explore that further. There's no question and answers at the end. This is a little bit shorter with no question and answers at the end, but still very profound. The Artist is God by Neville Goddard. God is the great artist, and there is no artistry so lovely as that which perfects itself in the making of its image. God has but one consuming objective, and that is to make you into his image, that you may reflect and radiate his glory. On this level, however, God exists as the human imagination, for the human imagination is the divine body called the Lord Jesus. On the highest level, God's great artistry is concentrated on the making of his image. On this level, he as you can do the same. A friend may say, he would like to be a doctor. Another friend wants to be a successful businessman or a dancer. Every desire is an image. As the artist lowered to this level, you can form images of your friends. And if you persist in your assumption, in time your friends will radiate and reflect your artistry. God is the great dreamer in man, bound in a deadly dream until he forms the image called Christ in himself. Only when Christ is formed in man will he awaken from his dream of life. Now on this level you can be bound in a dream too. Perhaps you would like to be a great artist. That is your dream, your image. How would you feel right now if you were? Can you believe your assumption is true even though your reason and senses deny it? Can you persist in your imagination as the highest level of your being persists in his image? We are told when you pray, believe you have received it, and you will. Prayer is not a lot of empty words, but imagination braced in feeling every Sunday. People go to church, say the Lord's Prayer, and come out of the building just the same as they were when they went in. Their words were empty, as no prayer was answered. Now they are going to stop praying to their demoted mythological saints, for that is all saints are. The 115th Psalm describes these so-called saints and tells us that those who believe in them are just as stupid as those who make and sell them. While here in this world, I asked myself how I could go about being the artist who could make myself into the image of a successful minister of the Word of God. I knew I would have to start on the highest level by assuming I had finished what I was starting to do, and I knew I would have to remain faithful to that end, that image. This I have done. The most creative thing in us, to believe a thing into objective existence. When you believe that something is already objective to you, even though your mortal eyes cannot see it. Can you walk drenched in the feeling that it is an objective fact until it becomes so? That's how everything is brought into being for all things exist in the human imagination. Who is God himself? Imagination is the divine body called Jesus, the Lord. If you are willing to step out, asking no one if it is right or wrong, and dare to walk in the assumption your image is true, it will come to pass. Let me share with you a simple story. A very dear friend of mine who lives in New York City was born in Russia of a very poor Jewish family. He knew what it was like to be frightened when he heard the Cossacks were coming, for they burned homes and caused pain for the sheer joy of frightening people. Joseph was the eldest of a family of five, a boy not more than nine or ten when his mother died, leaving his father to maintain his family alone. Little Joseph found a job taking money from a store to the bank and having it changed into smaller denominations. He had never known what it was like to wear shoes, but wrapped his feet in newspapers or whatever he could find to keep them warm. His clothes had always come from charity, but he, like all men, brought his innate knowledge with him when he came into this world. 
So one day as he watched the cashier changing the money he brought, he noticed the big copper coins, when rolled in paper, resembled the silver coins, even though their value was widely separated. Then he said to himself, wouldn't it be wonderful if he made a mistake? And in his imagination, Joseph took the money, rolled the window to him in the assumption that the mistake was already made. He then walked back to the shop, filled with the sense of joy. Reason told him no mistake was made, but he thought of all the things he could buy if he had the money. He would buy a pair of slacks, a pair of shoes, and eat until it came out of his ears, a thing he had never experienced before. He had the satisfaction of walking those many blocks in the mood of having what he wanted. The next day, when Joseph returned to the same teller, the man made the mistake. As Joseph left the bank, he wrestled with himself, but his poverty and embarrassment were greater than his ethical code. So he went to another bank and changed the money into the correct denominations and kept the overage. That night, he bought himself a pair of slacks, new shoes, and ate at a restaurant until he could eat no more. He told me that although he wrestled with his conscience all night, he could not justify his act, but he learned a lesson. He learned that Sir Anthony Eden was right when he said an assumption, though false, if persisted in, will harden into fact. Sir Anthony did not need position or money, but he knew a law which undoubtedly he used through his years. Today my friend Joseph is a multimillionaire. I am quite sure he is far, far richer in Caesar's dollars and cents than Anthony Eden, for Joseph learned and lived by this knowledge. He never duns his customers. When they are long overdue in payment, Joseph sits alone and mentally writes a letter thanking the man for the receipt of his check. And within four days, he receives it. If poverty would teach this lesson to everyone, all should be born equally poor. Joseph now lives in, in an apartment in New York City where he pays 12000 a year in rent, as well as 45000 a year rent for his street business. He now has a business in Paris, Puerto Rico, and Brazil, for he learned how to move. Leaving Russia at the age of 16, Joseph found a job driving a garbage truck in France, where seemingly by accident, he met the great dancer, Anna Pavlova. She suggested he follow in his father's footsteps and make undergarments for women, which he did and is now famous for. I'm asking you to do as Joseph did, where I'm teaching you a principle and leave you to your choice and its risk. I have told this story in the past, and there has always been someone in the audience who has criticized me for telling it claiming I'm leading people astray. I've always had a suspicion, however, that those who are most vocal in their criticism are justifying their own behavior. I'm not urging you to forget all these so-called codes, but to tell you that we all ate of the tree of good and evil and have suffered ever since. I am not suggesting you go out and steal from anyone, or that Joseph should, as some have suggested, pay the money back. If he did, to whom would he send it to? Stalin? Well, Stalin stole the entire country, not just a few coins, as Joseph did. Now, Joseph has given tens of thousands of dollars to help friends and charities, not to justify his act as a child, but out of the goodness of his heart. Tonight, I give you a principle. God is the great artist, who, as your own wonderful human imagination, is perfecting his work through the ages in the making of his own image in you. Do you have an image? Name it. Now, are you willing to simply assume that you have it and wait for its objectification? Every image has its own appointed hour to ripen and flower. If it be long, wait, for its appearance is sure and will not be late. Are you willing to wait for the happiness you now seek, or are you going to try to go on the outside and make it so? If you're willing to apply this principle and let it happen, you will become the successful businessman, doctor, minister or whatever you desire to be. If you will assume your desire and live there as though it were true, no power on earth can stop it from becoming a fact because you are God and your only opponent is yourself. There's nothing but God, but man not knowing this creates opposition and calls it Satan or the devil, both of which are just as non-existent as Saint Christopher. Millions believe in them and give them power they do not possess but I urge you to believe in nothing but God, who is your own wonderful human imagination. In time, you will depart this world, certainly. This is a world of death, so why remain here forever? You will play your part here while God forms his image in you. And when that image is complete, you will awaken to be born from above. 
then the child will appear to signal your birth and fulfill the promise recorded in the book of Isaiah. Unto us a child is born. Five months later, God's son is given to you as a sign that the image is now perfect. When you look into the face of your son, David, you will see yourself as the eternal youth. You are now God the Father, and He is your Son who glorifies you. If you could see yourself matured, you would see the Ancient of Days, whose Son is His image, yet eternally young. That image is now being formed in you, and in time will become objectified. So have faith, which is nothing more than the subjective appropriation of your objective hope. Set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you when the Christ Spirit stands before you and calls you Father. In the fourth chapter of Galatians, Paul tells of Christ's formation and questions himself, saying, I see you are worshiping days and months, seasons and years. I'm afraid I've labored over you in vain. When I see a man, I thought, had outgrown these little concepts, turned back to images and days, months, seasons and years, and call them holy, when there is no such thing in God's kingdom. I feel like Paul that my labor has been in vain. Every moment of time is holy, and wherever you stand is holy. It may be a bar, but it is a holy place because you are there. Others may say it is wrong, but I ask you, who is standing there? God. And wherever God is, is holy ground. This is true of every person in the world, but they do not know it. They think they must leave those they love and rush off to church on Sunday morning, and if they don't make it on time, they have violated God's wish. But God wishes you would stay home and love your family, and if that one day you would ease the burden of your wife with children, do it. If you can't do it as well as she does through the week, do it to the best of your ability. She will understand and be blessed for your trying to ease her burden for the moment. That is far better than rushing off to some church and praying to gods which do not exist. I am not telling you not to go to church. Some people enjoy the comfort and friendships found there. They enjoy the coffee hour after the meeting, perhaps more than the service. Many hope to meet a mate there, but that is not what I am talking about. I am telling you of the great artist, his name is I Am, for he is your own wonderful awareness of being. On this level of Caesar, follow the same pattern, the highest level of our awareness of being is doing. As the collective unity together we had an image, our image was to make man like us. Then we became enslaved in this deadly dream and now suffer amnesia. But the heavenly man that we truly are will not break his pledge. He remains bound by his deadly dreams of good and evil until he forms his image in himself. Every state you choose to enter will be recorded and added up while he remains faithful to that divine image and when the image appears you will see David, the anointed Christed one. I have found my anointed, my Christed, my chosen one, my firstborn, and he has called me Father. He has called me God, the rock of his salvation. This is true, for I brought him into being. Now I can depart in peace, for I have done exactly what I promised myself to do in the beginning of time. It has been taught us from the primal state that he which is was wish until he were. I wish to make man in my own image. I did not deviate from my wish, but kept that vision before me constantly, no matter what I did in the lower levels of my being. I made it all add up, for all things work for good to him who loves the Lord, who is the individual's highest being. Tonight every wish of your heart is possible to attain. Let no one tell you what you ought to wish, for all things are yours to appropriate now. A friend shared a series of visions with me. She wants to be a composer, and I will tell her right now, you can be as great as you wish to be. In one of her visions, she found herself in the company of Chopin, who was showing her how to compose. They seemed to be walking above a body of water, and as she looked, the water was not only the subject, but the inspiration of the composition. This young girl, now only in her teens, shared this fantastic vision with me. In another dream, she was told to read the book of Numbers. Well, it is in the twelfth chapter of Numbers that we are told that God speaks to you in dreams and makes himself known in vision. When vision breaks out into speech, the presence of deity is affirmed. In her vision, the spirit of Chopin was telling her, even though she did not see his face, how to compose. 
You do not see the face right away. In fact, the real face you will not see until the sun appears. Just prior to that, you will see the risen Lord infuse with him. But when his sun appears, you will see yourself made young. David is the image of the being who fuses with you only young. He in eternal youth is your son who has always done your will. In my friend's vision, she is with Chopin. Being by nature a pianist, what better instructor could she have? She is being spiritually instructed, for she is the spirit of Chopin, as in the depth of her soul they are one. Whatever your inspiration may be, you will draw to yourself that which you have assumed you want to be. If in your mind's eye a certain person is great, and you want to be as great as he is, you will draw him out of yourself to instruct you. You're only instructing yourself, however, for every vision takes place within the human imagination. All that you behold, though it appears without, it is within your imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. Choose an image you would like to express. Feel you are that image. So appropriate it that it must come forth in your world of shadows. Do that, and you are praying for prayer is your own wonderful human imagination drenched with feeling. I could tell you story after story after story of those who have drenched themselves with the feeling of having their desire and getting it. Feel the wedding ring, if that is your desire. Feel the thrill of applause or the joy of your child in your arms. Anything is possible if you can feel it. But if you're going to use reason, it will never happen. Because failure becomes your image. You don't realize it, but there are two of you. And it is your deeper self that tells you it can't happen. But no real belief can ever be suppressed for long, for your inward conviction must find some external objective habitation, and it will. What is your deep conviction tonight? What is the true image you believe yourself to be? Is it that you are a failure or a success? If you believe the headlines of the paper, you will be frightened, for they thrive on crisis. Do you know there are people who only write headlines? Good news is always put on the tenth page. But if the news is frightening, it will find front page print. Our boys are on their way to the moon tonight. Their trip made the first page today, but if something violent happens tomorrow, the violent act will get the headlines and not our exciting trip to the moon. Ignore the headlines and remain faithful to your image. What do you really want? Don't try to tell me that it is going to be difficult because your very words block its fulfillment. Can you believe all things are possible to God? No one would have bet one nickel on me when I left the little island of Barbados at the age of 17, but having voiced a desire to be a minister of the word of the God. Unschooled as I was, and still am, in the formal sense of the word, who would believe the word of God would be revealed to me? But my one consuming desire was to have a true vision, because I knew that a man becomes what he beholds. I didn't want the vision to be false, even if it was given to me by some giant with many degrees, because I would be accepting the vision he follows. I wanted truth to be revealed to me, for if it is true that a man becomes what he beholds, then I wanted to behold truth, that I would become it, and I have. When I tell you of David, I speak from revealed truth and not from something I found in a book. Rabbis, ministers, and priests deny my words because they are not what they were taught. They bring their own prefabricated misconceptions of Scripture to Scripture and cannot understand the words one who has witnessed the truth of God's Word. I found the truth as Paul did. It did not come from a man, nor was I taught it by a man. But it came through a revelation which was the unveiling of God within me. That unveiling occurred when I was confronted by and fused with the risen Lord. While you are here, do not neglect Caesar's world. You have to pay rent, buy food and clothing. Don't let anyone tell you this is sordid. You must do it while you're here. You must render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Forget the concept that Jesus got food from out of the air, for it is not true. The man in whom the pattern awoke labored as you and I do. And if you think I'm being foolish about it, read the first two verses of the eighth chapter of Luke where it states he was supported by three women from their own substance. When Paul began to tell the visions as they unfolded in him, he said, I earn my own bread. He didn't get any bread out of the atmosphere, but labored as a man, while he tried to persuade everyone 
that they would awaken to discover they were God, and all that is said of him in the gospel they would personally experience. I am telling you what I know from experience, not theorizing, I am not speculating. I hope you will so believe me that when I depart this world, you will not forget my message. May I tell you, you may think you have wavered in the forming of that image you set out to do in the beginning, but you have not. For the depth of your being and my being are one, and that brotherhood has never once faltered. He agreed in the beginning to dream this dream of life in concert. This we have done and will continue to do until the image is formed in each one of us. At the end of these lectures, Neville would give two minutes of silence as we will do now, followed by discussion. Now, let us go into the silence. Definitely one of my favorite lectures, The Artist is God. Of course, I say that with all the lectures because they're all so amazing. And I just love Neville Goddard's use of language. In this one, we get a very interesting story of his friend Joseph, who I believe he's mentioned before in relation to whenever he has a debt, he just imagines that person paying back his debt. But a very interesting story of imagining that he would make a mistake and getting the money by mistake and sort of exploring that moral realm with your imaginings. If in your imagining you're able to gain money from others in a way like this, is it good or bad? Well, obviously in this particular case, uh, he was able to buy some food and do some things with it, but inevitably it will come back to you. And so that's what they were saying. You know, the people were speaking out against it, but it, it's going to happen. That's why I say in the best interests of all. And that's what I like to imagine that when I'm receiving money, I'm receiving it in the best interest of all. When I do that, that is something that has helped me receive money in the proper way because you will receive money when you start using the law. You'll receive it by the most bizarre means and you'll have the opportunity to make money illegally or shady and there will be a little test that you have of yourself. All you have to do is imagine that you're receiving the money in the best interest of all, not in violation of any laws. And when you do that, you'll receive the money. You are totally in control and you are God. It's really powerful when you come into realization of your true power. There's also the idea that there is no evil, that we create satans or devils. I love that comment that he makes is that those are just opposition that we create. Another interesting thing he always mentions when you go through the promise, when you see the Ancient of Days, when you see God, 
God really looks like you. And so that's reflected in a number of his lectures. Another point that he makes is, are you worshiping days and months, seasons and years? And if you are, that's the same as worshiping, you know, astro- astrology or birthdays or seasons or holidays. And he's saying that every moment is holy. So it's true. It, imagine if we could treat every single day like Christmas. Every single day is a holy and blessed day. It's a powerful idea. But ultimately, the key, the reason I was drawn to this is that God is the artist. And God is an amazing artist in this creation that we've had. And he is creating an image of us becoming like him. It's an incredibly detailed piece of art taking thousands of years to create. But God is creating himself, multiple versions of himself with free will and power to create universes. And you're learning these lessons in this age. You're learning the lessons of creation. And each of these lessons we learn, and the more we learn, is powerful. The story that he gives of the woman that is conferring with Chopin is super powerful. As I have said, I've talked to the authors that I read, and oftentimes I become aware that they are me. And you can confer with anybody that you want if you want to learn the arts of engineering or whatever it is you want to learn go and imagine that person and then soon you'll be in close contact and discussion with them in your vision and it's powerful when you do that the great thing that is so appealing to neville is that he's not referring to some theory he's not referring to some book and so you have to ask yourself if it's authentic and it resonates with you but he's saying he experienced this And the more we read these with the passion, you have to at least come to the assumption that he believed it deeply in his heart, that he had experienced this and it wasn't just a dream. So we got many more lectures to come, so many different things to learn, but it's always good to know that God is the great artist. We're all artists creating an amazing world around us all the time. And then when I become artistic, I feel like I'm becoming closer to God understanding his thought processes. As I paint a painting, I feel like I'm closer to God. That is the way that God is. He is an artist creates, or she, the power is, an artist that is creating all the time. And when we tune into that creativity, we're also tuning into God. But God is everything. There's not something that's more God than less. Yes, God is the artist, but he's also the non-artist. God is everything. You are God. When you awaken to this, it is the most amazing thing. In any case, all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.